Today's video, we're going to talk about a circuit known as the Gilbert cell, named after Barry Gilbert uh, of Tektronics and Analog Devices and other places. Uh, and the Gilbert cell is really extensions upon a circuit that was first published by Howard Jones in 1963 and patented in 66. There are many applications for a circuit like this, a uh, four-quadrant analog multiplier, a variable gain amplifier, automatic gain control circuits, a balance modulator or frequency mixer and phase detector, just to name a few. I'm not going to go heavy into the, the math behind the operation of the circuit, but rather just go into giving you a basic understanding of how it works kind of more intuitively. Uh, and I would say a good prerequisite for this video is to review my back to basics video on the differential amplifier or, or diff amp or emitter coupled pair, long tailed pair, lots of different names for it. But I would say you may want to review that video first to get very familiar with the operation of the differential pair uh, because that's kind of key to the operation of the Gilbert cell. So let's quickly review the operation of the differential amplifier. Consider this circuit here. If the bases of Q1 and Q2 are at the same voltage, uh, the tail current essentially splits evenly between the two transistors, again, assuming the transistors are matched. So if there's no voltage difference between the two bases, then equal current flows in the collectors. That means that there's no voltage difference between uh, the collectors of those transistors. I mean, the voltage drop across R RL1 and RL2 is the same. Now, if we apply a small differential voltage at the input, we're going to basically cause the current between the two transistors to seesaw back and forth uh, based on that voltage difference and that's going to result in a voltage difference appearing between the two collectors. That small signal differential gain is equal simply to the transconductance uh, times the load resistance and the transconductance is simply the collector current divided by the thermal voltage VT and then IC, the collector current, is just the tail current divided by 2. Now a key thing in looking at this equation is that the gain of the differential amplifier is a function of the collector current. Now we want to remember this. This is actually very important and it's kind of a key aspect of how the Gilbert cell operates. In fact, this is such a key point, let's actually go take a look at it on the bench. This is the test circuit that we use to show the differential amplifier gain versus tail current. I've got a simple diff amp set up here. Uh, resistor divider to give me about 4 volts here that I'm using to bias both sides of the diff pair uh, with uh, through a couple of 3.9K resistors. I've got a variable current source here, a simple uh, single transistor current source driven by a variable uh, power supply. As we ramp this power supply voltage up, that will increase the tail current uh, that's being provided by this transistor. We'll measure that with an ammeter. And at the same time, we'll also be monitoring the output voltage on one side of the diff pair. Uh, and we're driving the input with a simple uh, function generator to AC coupled into one side. So we have our test circuit built up here on the breadboard. The Simpson 260 meter is going to be monitoring the tail current. This is our input voltage, about 100 millivolts peak to peak. Our output voltage will be measured here on channel 2 with a 200 millivolt per division scale. Now with the tail current at zero, our gain is zero. So if we start turning the tail current up, we can actually now start to see some output beginning to appear. As we increase the tail current, we can see the output voltage increasing. So it's a very simple demonstration of how the small signal gain of a differential amplifier is a function of the tail current or the bias current through the transistors. Now, of course, on its own, uh, having an electronically controlled uh, amplifier here can be a very useful thing for things like automatic gain control or electronically adjustable volume controls, things like that. But this is a key principle for the operation of the Gilbert cell. Okay, so tuck that piece of information about being able to vary the gain of a differential amplifier by varying the tail current, you know, just tuck it away for the moment. And let's take a look at another aspect of what makes up the Gilbert cell. Let's consider what happens when you sum the outputs of two diff pairs, like we have here. Uh, you can really kind of consider these as operating almost independently and just add the results up. Uh, so we could take a look at uh, you know, what's going on with this diff pair and how I1 gets split between the two collectors, and that contributes to a voltage drop across the resistors. And similarly, we can consider what's going on with this diff pair, and then its collector currents also pulling more current down through those resistors. 
So in effect, the current through the resistors is the sum of the collector currents of the transistors that are connected to it. And that's all there is to it. Uh, we can you know, connect up more and more of these things, but the idea with a Gilbert cell is we're going to have you know, the outputs of two diff pairs connected together into a common set of loads, and what's going on with either of those diff pairs is ultimately going to determine the voltage drop across each of those resistors. So this is a very simple differential summing amplifier. This next aspect of the Gilbert cell is one that can be a little tricky or confusing. While we've directly connected up the collectors of the two diff pairs, we've cross-connected the inputs or the bases of the transistors. We can see that uh, Q1 is connected to Q4 and Q2 and 3 are connected together. Now this can appear confusing, but let's consider a couple of cases and actually it turns out to be not so confusing at all. Uh, if the two tail currents are identical, okay, then the voltages dropped across the R1 and R2 are always going to be identical. Because consider what happens. Let's say that uh, there's no difference at the input voltages here. Uh, therefore, I1 is split evenly between the two collectors and I2 is split evenly between the two collectors. So essentially we're going to have the same currents flowing through each of those resistors. Therefore VO, or the differential voltage here, is going to be equal to zero because our voltage drops across uh, R2 are the same. Now let's say uh, VI is such that it, this input is much higher than this one. Q1 is completely on, Q2 is off, therefore Q4 is on and Q3 is off. In that case, if these two transistors are out of the picture, I1 is flowing that way and I2 is flowing that way, and if I1 equals I2, we still have no voltage difference on either side. So what we can conclude is if I1 equals to I2, the voltage output, the differential voltage output, is always going to be equal to zero no matter what happens at the input. Now, of course, if these two tail currents do not equal each other, then the output voltage will vary as a function of VI. In fact, the differential gain from VI to VO is going to be proportional to the current difference between I1 and I2, or between the two uh, tail currents. And depending on which tail current is higher or lower, the gain uh, of this amplifier can either be inverting or non-inverting. And of course, by varying the currents, one with respect to the other, we can actually vary the gain. So a very generic way to represent this is to say that the output voltage is equal to some factor k times uh, the input voltage difference, where that k is just uh, proportional to the difference between I1 and I2, and it can be a positive or negative number. And by varying that, we can actually go from you know, some positive number through zero to some negative number, depending on where those currents are. So you might ask, how do we vary these currents one way or the other with respect to each other? Well, again, the answer is another diff pair. Uh, simply a diff pair allows us to kind of rock current back and forth from one side to the other. So if we replace I1 and I2 with yet another diff pair, we have the Gilbert cell. Let's take a look at that. So here I've redrawn it just a little bit, replaced those two current sources with yet another diff pair, and I've got drawing a current source down here it could just be a resistor, it could be a current source, it doesn't matter. The idea is that the voltage input uh, between this lower diff pair is going to control the current split between the tail currents for these upper two pairs. Uh, this may look a little different than the previous schematic. All I did was slide R2 from being over here to being over here. It's still connected the same way, but this is now how a Gilbert cell is typically drawn. So now uh, we can see that the output voltage difference is now proportional not only to the input voltage difference uh, to these upper diff pairs, but also to the lower diff pair, because that controls the tail currents of the upper pairs. So in a very generic sense, the output voltage is proportional to you know, some scaling factor times the differential input voltage uh, appearing here and here, so VI1 and VI2. If VI1 equals V0, the output is going to be zero, the same voltage drop across R1 and R2, regardless of what happens down here at VI2, and vice versa. If VI2 is equal to zero, okay, uh, then uh, the output voltage is always going to be equal to zero, regardless of what happens with VI1. This is the fundamental Gilbert cell. Um, this works best if all these transistors are matched, 
So it uh, often appears as an integrated circuit. You know, some of the most common places where you'd find it are in the popular NE or SA602 or 612 um, you know, mixer uh, and local oscillator devices, also the older MC1496, and in countless other circuits where it may not even be specifically called out. This analog multiplier circuit is found in, in many, many places. So here's the test circuit that we've built up to show the operation of the Gilbert cell. Here's our upper uh, pair of diff pairs whose inputs are cross-connected, and then our lower diff pair that's controlling the currents going into the upper pair. Uh, I've got uh, two signals from signal generators here uh, going into the lower pair and the upper pair. Both of these are biased off of this simple resistor string down here. 2.2K uh, resistors biasing both sides of this compound diff pair up here and 2.2K resistors providing bias to the input of the lower diff pair. We've got a couple of capacitors to kind of make these points relatively stiff with respect to the signal frequencies and we're just going to apply these signals and take a look at the uh, output voltage uh, between the two collectors. So here's our test Gilbert cell built up on the breadboard here. Uh, signals are coming from the signal generator here, being tapped off and applied to the inputs as shown here. And these 50 ohm resistors are actually the terminations at the scope inputs there on channel 3 and channel 4. Now, since these input signals are being AC coupled into these uh, uh, circuits, the voltage that appears, say, here is going to go above and below the voltage that appears here. Now, this one is just DC biased. This one is biased to that same point. The AC coupling will essentially allow this AC voltage to impress itself upon this bias point, bringing it above and below the other side. So in effect, the uh, both you know inputs to the Gilbert cell have got an input voltage that's varying between a small positive and small negative input differential. So this is the input being applied to the lower diff pair, which is steering the currents into the upper diff pairs. And the input to the upper diff pairs is uh, this guy right here. So channel 1 right now is looking at one of the outputs of the, uh, the diff pair. And if we look, we can actually see the gain okay, growing as we reach the positive peak uh, of this lower steering pair. And then as we go, go down and cross through zero, the gain actually goes down to zero. And then goes, you know, the gain grows again as we increase the negative input differential voltage. And then it repeats back and forth. Now, of course, all these transistors aren't perfectly matched. That's tough to do with a couple of discrete devices. So the gain for the positive half cycle and the negative half cycle here is slightly different. We can see a different magnitude appearing here and here. But... That's uh, just due to uh, mismatches between the devices and not really critical for what we want to show here. Now something that may not be so obvious uh, between these two cycles is that there's a phase inversion. And let's take a look at that by bringing the channel 4 signal up and just in position here. And we can actually see, if we look carefully here, that during the negative half cycle, our output is in phase with that uh, higher frequency signal and during the positive half cycle here it's out of phase. That indicates that the gain uh, of this kind of cross-connected differential pair is being varied between some positive value and some negative value causing an inversion or not inverting uh, gain situation. Now of course we want to take a look at uh, both uh, collectors so we'll turn on channel 2 here and that's just going to overlay on top of channel 1 and we can see they're doing exactly the opposite thing while one is going positive and the other is going negative just as we expect with this diff pair is that these things, these voltages are seesawing back and forth and really the important thing is the difference between them I've got the math channel set up to be the voltage difference between them and we can actually see that this is now the difference between channel 1 and channel 2 and that same thing is, is applying here, is happening here is that we can see that during the positive half cycle of, of this input going on here uh, our gain is actually inverting okay we can see that this signal is out of phase 180 degrees out of phase of uh, this signal here and then during the negative half cycle we've you know inverted the sign of the gain and we can actually see that this signal is now in phase again just to illustrate that the output differential voltage is proportional to both uh, 
the input signal levels because it's really just a, a multiplication of these two. Let's vary the, these signals kind of independently. So varying the amplitude of the higher frequency input, which is the one up here, you can actually see you know, the output signal and the output differential signal grow and shrink as I change that amplitude. And similarly, if we switch over to the uh, lower uh, frequency input applied to the lower diff pair and vary that amplitude, we can actually see, again, the same thing. You know, essentially the output is the analog multiplication of these two with some scaling factor. Of course, mentioned at the very beginning of the video, we talked about a number of different applications. Uh, obviously, a, a four-quadrant multiplier. We've got uh, positive and negative voltages going on at the input, positive and negative going on at the output. So, it quite literally is a four-quadrant multiplier. Uh, we could also make this a variable gain amplifier. You know, if the input here, instead of being the sinusoid with some DC control voltage up or down, we essentially can control the gain of this diff pair by just adjusting that voltage up or down. Automatic gain control. You know, if that uh, input voltage was controlled by measuring the amplitude of a signal somewhere else, this could be set up in some kind of an automatic gain control loop. Now, of course, uh, the voltages that we see here are the typical kind of classic voltages of a balanced modulator, which is often used in radio circuits for creating, uh, you know, like single sideband signals or even AM signals. Now, for AM, we wouldn't want the phase inversion. What we would do is add DC offset to the analog, you know, baseband input so that we're simply varying the gain but not changing the sign. Uh, for single sideband or double sideband generation, we want to eliminate the carrier and therefore modulate above and below and create that change in sign on either side of the um, uh, baseband input phase. And of course, you know, phase detectors, other applications, because anywhere that we have a nonlinear operation and multiplication is a nonlinear operation, we effectively mix these two signals together. So any place where we want some kind of a mixer, like a frequency mixer and things like that, this is a very popular circuit to use. And because we can take advantage of the inherent matching of transistors when building this on an integrated circuit, it's a very common uh, uh, topology that's used for mixers on integrated circuits. So I hope you enjoyed this introduction to the Gilbert cell and that it's helped to take some of the mystery of this circuit uh, out of your minds. Uh, comments are always welcome. If you like what you see, please give me a big thumbs up, tell your friends, and subscribe. And we'll look for you next time. Thanks again.